This message entitled, Looking in All the Wrong Places? Try Between a Rock and a Hard Place was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on Easter Sunday, April 9th, 2023 by the Reverend Roy D. Warren Jr. The scripture reference is John 20. If you'll turn to John chapter 20, that's where we're going to be. I'm not going to go ahead and uh, read it through. We will be reading it through as we go through it. Um, so we'll look to that. But if you'll turn, turn to John 20, you'll be in the right area. Thank you, Jesus. John 20. Praise the Lord. Well, I think it's mostly, or almost, I'll put it that way, not mostly, but maybe almost unbelievable that we got there. We finally got here. Everything has been aimed to this. The Christmas season, believe it or not, was aimed at this. The season of Epiphany, which came right after that, remember? It was, it was all about making it clear, make it obvious, who is this Jesus? And that led us into the season of Lent, and in that time, we once again took a good look at who Jesus was, things he did, things he preached, things he taught, things he performed, like miracles, for example, every, every bit of it, okay? All to show who he was. Because if you're going to get to today without knowing who he really was, you're in sad shape. Okay? And I say that, not gloating, but I say that, I sure wish everybody was paying attention to everything that we've been looking at. Because he made it real obvious who he was. And he made it real obvious what this day is all about. I, I enjoy the flowers. I enjoy the banners. I enjoy the symbolism of the cross and the, and the, of the uh, uh, white cloths that are on that. And Good Friday, there were back, black cloths. And, and, you know, and all of the symbolism that goes from day to day and week to week and, and month to month. I, I appreciate all of that, okay? Because it speaks clearly of who this Jesus is. So we saw, it, we saw it through Advent, we saw it through the Christmas season, we saw it through Epiphany, we see it through Lent, we saw it all the way up until the other day when we came here for Good Friday, for Good Friday. I think throughout this time, and I'm not bragging, but I do think we've run a good race. And by that I mean, I think we've run the race that God has called us to do. Amen? There's a race here. There's a, there's a, but it's a marathon. <laughs> it's, it's not a 50-yard dash. I saw a race one time, and there was women, and they were all, they, you know, they, bang, the gun goes off, and they take off, and I don't know, 10 steps into it. The one girl loses her shoe. She stops. She goes back. She gets the shoe, she puts it on real quick, and she starts running. She, she ran, and she won. She beat him. And they didn't slow up for her either. They didn't go, come on, let's wait till Agnes gets up here. You know, no, no. They, everybody was going full tilt, and she won. You see? Now, we're not talking about a 50-yard dash. We're not talking about, you know, once around the track. We're talking about a marathon here. We're talking about a life lived. And I believe if you let Jesus be the one who plants down, I told you before, what about putting, he puts one step in front of the other. That was our symbolism. That was the way we saw it. You take this foot and you go here. And you take this foot and you go here. And you do that and you do that and you do that and you do that again. Praise God. And you keep doing it because it's not a 50-yard dash. It's a marathon. It's an ongoing thing. Okay? It's not even over after 20-some miles. It's a whole life. Lived for Jesus. And it's a good race if you let Jesus plant one foot 
in front of the other, and so forth and so on. Oh, no doubt, you look back on the whole thing and, you know, years ago or a year ago or a year from now, you can see a misstep, you can see a problem, maybe you lost your shoe. You know, don't quit. Don't go, well, I lost my shoe. I can't possibly catch up. So you go and grab your shoe and walk off to the edge of the thing and you know, guess what? You're not going to win that way. You're not going to even finish that way. This other girl, she put that shoe back on in a hurry, and she did it better than I could. She did it while standing there. I'd have to sit down and put that shoe on, and then I'd get a leg cramp, you know? (laughs) Boy, wouldn't that be it. Oh, sure, there have been times where you've misstep, and and don't, don't deny those things, and, you know, repent of them, and Turn from them and so forth. Don't act like they're absolutely nothing. But it doesn't determine the end result. This is what Spurgeon was trying to say. This is what I read this to you Friday night. And I wish I had the book here today. I could read it. I could read that particular devotional again. And you see what he's saying. It's he's already done it, people. He's already done the cross. He's already done the empty tomb. Now you live in it. Amen? Now you live in it. Turn to John chapter 20, please. And it's verse 1, very first verse. Let's just look at this for a second. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early. Early. When it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away, first thing she noticed, it was taken away from the sepulcher. I have a feeling she was probably so focused on Jesus. Now remember, she's not expecting to find a live Jesus. She's expecting to find a dead Jesus. But she's got some spices with her, and she's planning on anointing the body. Okay? But she's not thinking logically. She's forgetting that there's a stone. Okay? So she goes unto the sepulcher and she sees the stone is taken away. That's not what she expected to see. She expected to see the stone in the way. Okay? And maybe had forgotten that it was in the way and was bringing the spices anyway. I don't know. She's just, she's thinking of Jesus. So she's not really focused on the the logic of the whole thing. She just wants her Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that, people. There's a lot of people that don't think you're being very logical about Jesus. So don't worry about it. Amen? That's right. Don't worry about it. So focused on Jesus, she wasn't thinking logically. She forgot the stone would be there, and now she's messed up. The stone would be in the way. That huge rock would still be blocking their entry. It's like Jim read in uh, Matthew, you know, that the uh, Mary Magdalene, and, you know, it mentions different people. The, the different gospel writers have a different focus. The Holy Spirit has instructed each gospel writer to say it the way the Holy Spirit wants it said. So don't get all in a tizzy because this one says this and this one says that. It does because the Holy Spirit told it to. They're all true. They're all true. For example, if there's a whole group of people that come to the tomb and another gospel mentions there's one, guess what? There was more than one. Does everybody see that? You got to understand that because you'll have people try to twist that and see. See, the Bible has error in it. It's wrong. It's made up by men and they made boo-boos. They, they got it wrong. This gospel says there was one person. Another gospel says there were a bunch. Well, there were a bunch. But there was also one. All right. I think you get the idea. Listen, there was an illustration that I shared on Friday night that I feel really speaks to what we're looking at here today. So if you don't mind, I'll repeat it. Sheep. When they're lost, they don't really know they're lost. Only the shepherd does. A lost coin doesn't know how it's lost, doesn't know 
doesn't know anything about it, really. Because <laughs> quite frankly, the coin is not alive, okay? So the coin does not know, all right? But the owner does. The prodigal son didn't think he was lost either. In fact, at the beginning of his whole jaunt, his whole journey, he was living it up. He thought this is going to be great. I have my father's money and now I can really spend and I can really dig into life. Enjoying the adventure of a lifetime, he looked at it. And if you had asked his father, he would have said, my son is lost. My son is lost. Where was the father when his son was lost? And I guess maybe why I wanted to repeat this is I just want to be real clear about what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that the father physically went with the son or after the son into the town and he was there at the pigsty and he was there for this and he was there for that, but he was there. You hear me? Emotionally, spiritually, mentally, he was there with the son. Some would argue that he never left home that he never went after his boy, but I believe the father was in the faraway country as well. Not a day or a night went by that the father was not with his younger son. Loved ones who are left behind know their special kind of lostness. A wife of a man who fights in a foreign country goes to that country in her thoughts a thousand times a day. She's there. Do you hear me? She's there. The loved one of a hostage is held hostage too. The parent of a sick child fights disease just as surely as their boy or girl does and feels every pain. There was a little girl in children's hospital a few years ago who isn't there anymore. Jesus did that. Day after day, hour after hour, the father of the prodigal son was in that faraway country as well. He was suffering the anguish and the emptiness that a life of excess brought to his son. There's not a parent alive who has not experienced the hurt of their child if there is real love there. Not a parent alive. That's, a, that's the human picture of a supernatural love that God has. He goes where we go. He feels every loss. He feels every disappointment. And he feels every pain. If you want to look in all the wrong places, you will find yourself between a rock and a hard place. But that's not to say that you... We're not supposed to be there in the first place. Because God's got a plan for the rock and the hard place. I'm going to show you that. We're told that Mary went early, the break of dawn. In the definition, it says it was sunrise. It was just turning light. It's what they call that first light. You know, where it's, I saw it this morning. You know, I got up about five o'clock. And it was dark for a good while after that. And then you start to see just a little bit of light. That's the first light. Okay? And when she got close enough to see, it was amazing. She hadn't expected it, but the stone was rolled away. She wasn't even thinking about the stone. I mean, as far as she was concerned, it wasn't there. And this is the amazing thing about the whole thing. It wasn't there. God made it possible for that to be gone. Like Jim said, scripture even says, the, an angel moved that stone out of the way. Glory to God. Perhaps she was just so scared. You start to string some of these stories together and you can put them together. They really, there's no lies in here. It's all just another aspect of the same story. Okay, so she comes and she sees that from a distance, doesn't go near enough to see inside or anything like that, and starts running. Oh, she started running. Look at verse 2. It says, then she runneth. And you know what runneth means? It means run. 
Okay? See, that in the Bible, that's, where, that's what runneth means. Run. Okay? Runneth is a, <laughs> is, is a, is a running. Okay? Runneth. It's King James English, okay? Runneth. Okay? You know what the Greek word is? Treco. T-R-E-C-H-O. And it means with haste. To run hastily. To run the course fast. Runneth. She's not just jogging people. You know? She, she's not just fat. You know what they call that? Speed walking? You know, she's not. The, no, she is lit out for home. Okay? She's running and she comes to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, and the Bible says, whom Jesus loved. Now, I want to be real clear about this. I mentioned this the other night because it mentioned it the other night. It doesn't mean he only loved one disciple and the rest he couldn't stand their guts. No, that's not what it means, okay? When it says the one that he loves, he's talking about John. It's the way that John is depicted in the Gospels. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay? And saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre. Nobody ever said that yet. Okay? Nobody. She didn't even get close enough. She was probably still, I don't know, 100, 200 feet away. And it was just turning light. She didn't have any idea what was going on. But she assumed because the stone was gone that somebody had stolen the body. That's what she assumed. And we know not where they have laid him. Laid means a horizontal, passive positioning. Okay? Horizontal, passive positioning. We don't know where they laid him. Okay? She ran to the disciples... Peter and John in particular, they've taken away the Lord. They horizontally and passively have laid him somewhere, but I know not where. In fact, Mary, you don't know anything. You don't know that anybody took the body. You don't know that. You haven't seen it. You assume, because the stone's gone, that somebody took the body. Okay. Because, see, nobody took the body. That's how you know she doesn't know what she's talking about. Nobody did take the body. Jesus was raised. Praise God. And it's like Jim said, the angel takes away the stone, but not to let Jesus out. I mean, there's Jesus. He can be sitting with a couple of followers of his in Emmaus, and all of a sudden, poof, he's gone, and he's in Jerusalem the very same half second. There's Jesus. He gets to Jerusalem a half second later and poof, he's in the room with his disciples never once knocking on the door, not opening any of the windows or the doors. He just poofs. Okay? This is his resurrected, glorified body doing this. Okay? Nobody took the body. <laughs> See, so you know you're wrong right there. This was just her gut reaction, okay? Don't condemn her for it, I'm just saying. She's just operating out of the gut level right now. And it was extremely logical. But, you know, how logical are you supposed to be? Your Lord and Savior was dead, and now he's alive. How logical do you really want to be? Okay? It sure made more human common sense than being raised from the dead. I mean... Humanly speaking. Okay? Look at verses 3 and 4 and 5. And 6, I think. Yeah. Peter, therefore, went forth and that other disciple, namely John, and came to the sepulcher. Now watch. So they ran both together. They're booking it. Okay? And the other disciple did outrun Peter. And most commentators will try to suggest that John was younger. I think he probably was. He did... He did live a bit longer than the other disciples. He lived into the 90 ADs, and then, you know, but the other ones all died in the 60s. So, you know, he was probably younger. He might have been a teenager back at the time of being with Jesus. Just 
thinking, okay? And the other disciple did outrun Peter. Prostechio, to run very hastily. Okay? So he outran Peter. And John got there first to the sepulcher. But John stooped down, it says in verse 5, and looked in. And he saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. He didn't just barge in. It was, it's not that he's scared. It's not that. No, I think there's a, it's a sacred moment. This is something to enter into, not barge into. Okay? And so that's what he does. So he, he sees the linen claws lying there, but he didn't go in yet. He's in awe. He's in reverence. Do you remember I was telling you about the time uh, Cindy and I went to go pick up an Easter lily after Easter at her mom and dad's church? And it was the church where we were married, actually. And it was, um, it was the pastor. He was there. And anyway, he sees me up at the back of the church, and I'm looking at the various flowers and so forth, and I think they were probably all lilies, and, you know, and, and so he was wondering why I wasn't going up and just getting one. You know, was I looking for the biggest one? Was I looking for the smallest one? Was I looking for the one with the most buds <laughs> or any of that? No, it's that I had been taught in my church respect. You don't run around. You don't yell and scream. You don't, you know, run around and jump over the rail and all that kind of stuff. It's almost like this is holy ground, okay? There's, there's a respect that goes along with the things of the church. And, and I'm not saying he didn't understand that, but that's what my reasoning was. I wasn't looking for the biggest flower or anything. I'd get the smallest one. It'd be lighter. <laughs> anyway. So he didn't go in. He was in awe. He was in reverence. Okay? He's like, like being at the bedside of somebody. He stooped down. He leaned over. He peered within. And then verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher. So Peter goes beyond and probably in a sense literally dives into the sepulcher. There's a... a, a steps that go down into this hole where the rock used to be and I have a feeling he probably just dove into it and because the idea was to get there as fast as possible to see what's going on here so Simon Peter following him went into the sepulcher and seeing the linen clothes lie now watch this verse 7 and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself there's, this is an important thing, though we're not told point blank exactly what the meaning is, but from historical records, we do know that if the master of the, of the house, so to speak, was done with his dinner, he would take his napkin, he would crumple it up, okay, now this is not, <laughs> okay, these aren't paper napkins and they don't have Easter lily printed on them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's, you know, I'm talking about cloth napkins, cloth this, cloth, cloth tablecloth, the whole thing. Anyway, so the master goes ahead and takes his cloth napkin and crumples it and tosses it down on the table. What that means is that he's coming back. Okay? No, it's just, no that's the, that means he's done with his dinner. He's done with his dinner. But if he folds it up, and he sets it alongside his place setting, sets it alongside the plate itself, okay? It means I'm coming back. And this meant he was coming back. This meant he was coming back. Then went in also that other disciple, namely John, who hadn't come in yet, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw, and he believed. He knew that he was on holy ground. Jesus had said, he had said it before, but it wasn't scripture to John before this. And now it was. It wasn't scripture to Peter before this. 
And now it was. There's, a, there's something in here that we got to get a hold of. It says here, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't get that. He had said it. He had said, I'm going to be chased around by the religious leaders. I'm going to be uh, tortured. I'm going to be crucified. And three days later, I'm going to rise again. He said that. And he said that more than once. And they didn't get it. Quite frankly, just how you, just the same way you didn't get it for quite a few years. If you're honest about it. Right? Okay? It must rise again. All right? Must. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Okay? They knew they needed something. I don't know that they knew exactly what they needed, but they needed the Holy Spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory be to God. All right? Oh, hallelujah. Remember, if it's crumpled and it's thrown on the table, he's done. He's walking up away from the table and he's going away. He's going to go outside and go home or whatever it is. If it's folded all nice and neat, it's a sign that the master is coming back. Finally, John goes in and when he saw it all, he believed. Okay? He believed. And it says in verse 9, it says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. You see, now they were on holy ground. And they hadn't felt that before, I don't think, or not much, but now they do. And Jesus had said it, but it wasn't scripture to them. Listen, mark your place in John 20 for a minute, and let's go back to Luke 24. Okay? Now I want to show you this. Uh, because it's just so obvious. Well, it's just so crystal clear. Turn to John 20, no, Luke rather, Luke 24. Okay, Luke 24, and this is right after Jesus had said, and this, in fact, this is Luke's version of the resurrection uh, of Jesus. And, the, and there's an important point here that's being made. And the angels are there, and, and they said to the, to the people that were coming to see Jesus, they, why seek ye the living among the dead? I mean, this Jesus is alive, and you're looking for him like he's dead. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? He is not here. He is risen. Remember, look at, this is what the angel says. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? Do you, is this a fixture in your memory? Is this a fixture in your mind? Does, does it make you grasp at anything? Is it, does it, you, do you recollect this thing? Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. Do you remember that? And you know what the next verse says? And they remembered his words. Oh, praise God, people. They remembered his words, and they returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Glory to God. Uh, I don't think you have to come back there, so move on to John 10, would you? Over to John 10. Just turn there. Okay? John 10 uh, and... Uh, let's see... Okay, yeah, uh, Jesus is telling the story about the good shepherd and how he is the good shepherd and about the sheepfold and about the porter and all of that kind of stuff. Verse six, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. In other words, let's just be frank about it. They didn't get it. 
they didn't get it. Flip over a couple of pages to John 12, verse 16. Okay? John 12, verse 16. This is the Palm Sunday. They took the palm branches. Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. Comes in the name of the Lord, etc., etc. Verse 15. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. Verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. Now watch. But when Jesus was glorified, When Jesus was glorified, then they remembered they, that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. That's when they remembered. See, they didn't understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, after he's been dead, he's raised from the dead, okay, and, and ready to go back up into heaven, basically at that point, by now they get it. By now they get it. You see, you see what's happening. Betw they were between a rock and a hard place. And they didn't get it because they didn't know him as glorified. They didn't know him as the Savior. They didn't know him as God. Oh, they'd heard the words, but they didn't get it. They didn't, it says so. I'm not making it up, people. This says they don't get it until he is glorified. All right? I, I want to look at it this way, if you don't mind following my line of thinking. When I think of being between a rock and a hard place, that hard place is where the body was laid it was a stone slab, colder and harder than about anything you can imagine. All this past year, I've been in numerous hospitals, numerous imaging places, numerous x-rays, numerous CT scans, numerous MRIs, numerous, 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 okay? And about every time I did it, I said, well, I could see it right away that some of them had padding and some of them didn't. Some of the places where you lay. And I said over at uh, Catanning Hospital, uh, they, uh, the table I had to lay on had no, this is back when I was, my back was getting messed up half the time. And I have st several stress fractures in my back, okay? Which is probably adding to the stenosis and the, arthritis, and so forth, okay? Anyway, uh, they had me lay on a hard steel table, and I couldn't do it, or I did it very poorly, <laughs> okay? I couldn't do it. It was killing my back, okay? It needed to be padded. Uh, they may have padded it since. I don't know. But some of the other ones, like over at Butler and some of these imaging places, they have a little bit of padding on it. Well, that helps somewhat. And in a couple of times, maybe they had to add even more, just so I could lay down. Just so I could lay down. It's kind of hard. It's steel. There's no give. Okay? That's what I call the hard place. I mean, that's certainly a picture of it, isn't it? Somewhere between a rock and a hard place. And the hard place is that slab, I believe. If I'm, uh, this, is my, uh, this is my analogy. The slab that he was laid on when he was dead. Now, when he's dead, he doesn't have feeling, okay? He's not going, oh, gosh, let me move this way. Mm -mm, you know, no, he's dead, okay? It's cold. It's dead. He's dead. All right? The dead place is always going to be kind of hard. It is hard when someone dies. It is hard when there's a place of death. But after that, there's a way out the door. Let me show you what I mean. That is where the rock is. Now the rock, when it's in place, it's intended 
to block the way. Other people can't get in to steal the body. They're not worried about the body getting out. You know, they don't want somebody coming in. And so they got it blocked with this great big rock. And then we're told, in Matthew, I believe it was, Jim read it, that the angel moved the rock. I've said before that I don't think, and Jim mentioned it too, that I don't think it was moved to let Jesus out. I mean, if Jesus can just poof his way to Jerusalem and poof his way into the upper room with his disciples, then he can poof his way out of that, out of that cave, out of that sepulcher. I have no doubt about that. He doesn't need the stone rolled away. I think he was already out. I think the stone was rolled away so that we could see that he's not in there. And the others then could see that he's not in there. Okay? Praise God. I think that's true. He had that glorified body. There was no need for doors. There was no need for windows. He just swooshes in and there he is. Praise the Lord. Or swooshes out as the case may be. (laughs) Okay? Now I believe that rock was moved so that we could see in, so they could see in, okay? And they would know that he's not there. See, otherwise you leave the rock there, you're going to naturally think he's still in there. But he's not. So the angel moved the rock so we could all know that Jesus is not dead. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Once the rock is gone, we know that he is too. All right? So come away from the slab of death. Okay, because that's what that cold, hard slab represents. It's a place of dying and death. Come away from that place. Get as far away from the death as you can. I mean, let your sin be killed on that cross. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, but once he's already done that, people, he's done it. You don't have to expect him to do it again. You know? Do it again, Jesus. Do it again. You know, yeah, that's what a lot of people are expecting. The only other way to go is where the rock of our salvation used to be. That's the only other way out of there. Did you know there's no windows there? There's no back door. There's no elevator to the top, to the roof. You know, there's no stairway outside down through the basement and so forth. no and once once you come away from that rock or from that cold dead hard place okay you go where the stone used to be okay and that's where you'll find a life that is truly alive that's when you'll find a life that is truly great The way is no longer blocked. Did you know the way is no longer blocked now? You don't have to ask him to unblock it. It's already done. It's up to you and me to receive it. Amen? If if you don't see death over here at the slab, and you don't see an open door over there, where there used to be a stone, okay, then you need to look harder, (laughs) you know? Mary got there just as dawn was arriving, okay? Like Jim said, you know, he sees the sunrise, you know? Um, You know, Jim, I was thinking while you were saying that, there's probably an app for that. You could probably get an app for your phone to have those sunrises, and then you can... It, it beats 900 miles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you don't have a truck anymore, so you can't do that anyway. <laughs> All right. Praise God. Well, that's when you're going to be hard-pressed. If you're going to demand on holding on to that stone, and you're going to demand to not go through that open door, then you're going to be hard-pressed. And even though the rock isn't still there, you're still caught between a rock and a hard place. Because you're letting it be there in your mind and in your heart. Okay? So don't do that. Get away from the slab and get out of, the, get out of where the rock used to be. But you know what would be a good idea? 
Get out of there first and then go seek the rock of your salvation. Amen? And it's not going to be a heavy old stone blocking the way or blocking the way on the stairway. Can you imagine that? You get out, you see the light and everything, and now the stairway is blocked, and you've got to climb over this big rock. No, just go find the rock of your salvation. That's what you need. Amen? He's there. He's there. He's already done it. That's what Spurgeon's saying. He already did it. You don't need to beg him to do it again and again and again. Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. Just receive what he's already given. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We lift up the name of Jesus in this place. And we are so very thankful, dear God. Hallelujah. We spend so much time, sometimes, Lord, looking in all the wrong places. But we just need to step away from that hard stone slab of death and make our way where the rock used to be. And that rock is out of the way now. Hallelujah. So go find the rock of your salvation and let that lift you up. Hallelujah. We thank you, we praise you, and we give you all the glory here on this Easter Sunday. And we, and we love you, Lord. We love you because you first loved us. And you did so firstly. I don't even know if that's, if that's a word. He did it first. Amen? And now we love him back. That's what it is. So I pray, dear God, that you'll have your way today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God.